to a joint meeting of the city council and the school committee. Uh, I have called as mayor in accordance with Northampton Charter Section 7-2 Annual Budget Policy. Uh, I will first begin by asking the uh, council clerk to call the roll of both the city council and the school committee. Mr. Adams? Here. Mr. Carter? Present. Mr. Dwight? Here. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Councilor LaBarge? Present. Councilor Murphy? Here. Councilor Spector? Councilor Schwartz? Here. Here. Uh, Alvin Bourne? Here. Michael Flynn? Danny Meyer? Present. Lisa Minnick? Howard Moore? Here. Ted Nika? Here. Andrew Shelton? Here. Edward Sikowski? Present. So uh, I also wanted to acknowledge that as part of this meeting, the superintendent of schools is here, Brian Salter, as Good well evening. as Mark McLaughlin, who's the school business manager, and uh, Susan Wright, who is the city's finance director, is here as well. And obviously, I want to thank Mary Madura, uh, uh, the clerk of the city council, for uh, uh, taking uh, notes this evening. I also want to acknowledge a couple of other elected officials who are here. Uh, John Cotton, who's uh, one of my colleagues on the Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School Board of Trustees. He's also the chair of the board. And Bonnie Burnham is here, who's with the uh, Forbes Library Trustees Board. So I want to thank you both for being here as well. Um, so the purpose of tonight's meeting, uh, again, the one item on the agenda is that I am required now as part of the charter to review the financial condition of the city, uh, revenue and expenditure forecasts, and other relevant information in order to develop a coordinated budget. So this is really kind of a kickoff to the budget season uh, where I'm attempting to kind of set the stage uh, with some projections about the upcoming year. So uh, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so the things I want to really cover tonight are uh, some of the key accomplishments in FY 2013. I want to spend some time focusing on our <coughs> reserve position and why it's important. I want to look at how we compare with other communities. And then I want to dive into both the revenue trends and the expense trends, and then what all this means for FY 2014. So in FY 2013, uh, we tried to do uh, uh, several different things. We, we obviously tried to both increase appropriations for several of the key accounts that have been historically underfunded, um, again, so that we would not have to be reliant on free cash uh, to make transfers into those <clears throat> line items during the budget year. We also worked very hard to try to uh, have our free cash certification uh, come in at a very healthy number. That number was uh, 2.8 million this year. Uh, we then took and appropriated about 900,000 of that to capital projects. And we placed about 500, we put 500,000 of that into the capital stabilization fund to help build up our reserves. I've also implemented very tight controls on spending. Uh, I've been reviewing all spending in my departments uh, over $250. And in June, I'm planning to present an order uh, to try to appropriate unspent free cash in FY13 into the stabilization fund. So the theme, at least in, in what we were trying to do in the FY13 budget, was obviously to try to continue to provide the quality services, try to uh, make sure that we can maintain the personnel that we need to be able to deliver those services, but also really looking at um, trying to be less reliant on one-time monies when we build our budgets, relying on reserve funds. Uh, to be able to do that and really focusing on our reserves. Um, so reserve position and why this is important. Um, we just completed a um, bond rating call with, uh, with Moody's Investor Services. We, we are rated uh, by two different bond rating services, Moody's and Standard and & Poor's. And, uh, and what this involves is basically a conference call uh, I'm on the call, Susan's there, uh, usually our treasurer's there, our auditor's there, and it's sort of, uh, they go through all of our finances. They look at all of our balance sheets, they look at our reserve position, they look at our borrowing. They basically take a whole look at what we've been doing financially, uh, and then they give us a rating, and that rating is used as part of the bonding that we need to do to go out to borrow. So if you want to go to the next slide. One of the things, uh, well first of all, I'm very happy to announce that after that rating call a couple of weeks ago, uh, Moody's did allow us to maintain our current rating. Uh, uh, 
but there were some, 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 some cautionary notes in there. Uh, and again, I'll start with the first one. Going forward, review of the city's credit strength will, will heavily weigh its progress toward improving and maintaining balanced operations and replenishing reserves to levels equivalent to similar, similarly uh, related rated communities. What could make the rating go down? A decline in reserves or liquidity position during fiscal year 2013 and failure to grow reserves consistent. And our financial advisor uh, at First Southwest, uh, again, same story, looking at, uh, looking at where we are in terms of our unassigned fund balance at the end of 2012, which is about 5.2% of our budget. Uh, she pointed out that most communities that have the similar bond rating uh, that we have are somewhere in the range of 10% in terms of what they're showing in their unassigned fund balance. We'll go to the next slide. So this is the Moody's on the left and Standard & Poor's on the right. You'll see that we are at AA2 with Moody's. We just retained that rate and we're an A plus with Standard & Poor's. Just by way of comparison, I asked our bond rating agency that when we borrowed money recently for the police station, what would have been the impact had we been downgraded to AA3? And she ran the numbers in terms of and the debt curves and all the other things, and she estimated it would be close to we would have paid close to half a million more in interest uh, because that rating translates into the type of interest rates that we're able to secure. So the bond rating and the reserve position is very important. Go ahead. So this is a look at, over the last 10 years, what our, what our reserve position has been. And our reserves are made up of our free cash. That's in green. Uh, the, the general fund stabilization fund, and then the capital stabilization fund. Uh, these are all the various components that go into our reserves. And you can see how we, we were doing a great job in the early 2000s building up those reserves. You can also see when the economy uh, took a turn for the worse, uh, 2008 into 2009. You look at 2010, you can see we had a negative uh, free cash balance at the end of that year. Uh, that, was cons that was a revenue deficit. Uh, many other communities were in the same boat. That was the year that we, basically the state cut our aid mid-year um, and cut $2 million from our state aid. So we've worked really hard in the last couple of years, and particularly one of the things we focused on in FY13 was trying to rebuild those reserves. So you can see that we've made some progress to get them back up again. Uh, and again, it's, it's not only about the bond rating, it's also about having the ability to deal with emergencies that come up, uh, you know, unknown, un, unforeseen expenditures uh, that you need to be able to have those reserves uh, to tap into. Next slide. So now let's take a look at how we're comparing with other communities. And again, we'll start with the reserve position. So this is a, a sampling of similar sized and similar budget sized communities from across the state. Um, so you'll see just quickly Northampton, Tewksbury, North Attleboro, Milton, Andover, Stoughton, Belmont, Gloucester, Reading, Dedham, Danvers, and West Springfield. Northampton's over here on the right, and you can see uh, how our reserve position, these were FY12 numbers because those were the only ones that are available through the DOR right now because FY13 hasn't closed out. But you can see where Northampton rates uh, compared to comparable communities. We'll pull it in a little bit more local. Um, and these are neighboring communities. So this is Northampton, East Hampton, Ludlow, Greenfield, East Longmeadow, Longmeadow, Amherst, and West Springfield. Again, most of the other towns, uh, with the exception of West Springfield, are smaller towns than Northampton. But you can see where we are in terms of our reserve position, actually slightly less than even East Hampton in terms of our reserve uh, position. Go to the next slide. These are some of the other metrics from those same neighboring communities. This is our single family average value on our home. You see we do quite well in terms of our property value there. The state average is 357,996. We're at 297,323. This is the average single family tax bill for this current fiscal year, 2013. The state average is 4,926. You can see we're sort of right in the middle of the pack there at 4,240. And then you can see how everyone else Obviously, Amherst and Longmeadow at the upper end of the, of the spectrum. These are residential tax rates. So this is the per thousand tax rate of these same communities. Uh, again, in the current fiscal year, our new tax rate, which was uh, just, just went to $14.26. You see how that compares with other uh, neighboring communities uh, in the area, all the way up to Longmeadow, which is $21.54 uh, per thousand. So now let's take a look at the revenue, uh, what the revenue trends have been. Um, 
that graphic had an upward trend. I wish that were the case in the actual slideshow, but this is the, um, this is the pie as it looks for FY 2013. These are all the various sources of revenue uh, that we rely on to put the budget together. Obviously taxes, 61.5% being the largest share, that's property taxes, that's real estate, excise, meals taxes. Um, state aid, that's an important number which we'll talk about later in the presentation. Again, that's chapter 70, that's uh, unrestricted uh, general government aid. Uh, charges for services, uh, that's everything from uh, tuition that's charged for Smith Vogue students to other uh, services that we provide. Uh, that could be uh, buying a ticket in the parking garage or in the parking meter, et cetera. If you go to the next slide, you'll kind of see it broken out um, into those various parts with some of the component pieces underneath it. Um, again, uh, you see the various breakdowns. Uh, and we'll go through some of those revenue sources and take a look at how the trends have been over time. So this is our property tax revenue trend. This is again taking a look at the at the ten year uh, the ten year look at that. We've we've kind of broken it out. Residential obviously is the largest in the blue. Uh, red is the commercial. Green is the industrial. And and that smaller slice of purple is the personal property tax. You can sort of see it's followed a, a fairly. Uh, uh, Steady trend, that's obviously a result of Proposition 2.5, you know, where we're at, able to uh, raise it 2.5%, add in new growth, and, and calculate forward from there. 2010, there was a slight uptick. That was the $2 million general override that the voters adopted. That allowed us to move up uh, and, and, and give us a little bit more room in terms of, uh, in terms of our overall levy. This is new growth. New growth is that number that after you calculate the proposition two and a half increase, you're allowed to then add new growth. That's any new uh, buildings, any new housing. Uh, and so you can sort of see how new growth has gone over time. Again, looking at 2009, 2010, when there was a slump. We had a really good year in 2012. That was largely uh, Cole Morgan's new facility uh, coming onto the tax rolls as well as some new housing. Uh, we have uh, we went down slightly in 2013. We are projecting an increase for next year of about, well, we're projecting about 600,000 in new growth. Again, I think largely attributable to all the development that's happening on King Street as well as at Village Hill. So that's a positive sign. Because again, that's one of the other ways that we're allowed to grow that levy. This is uncollected taxes. Uh, again, this has never been a major problem, I think, for Northampton. Our, our collector's office, uh, working with our treasurer's office, has been very diligent in terms of making sure that, uh, that uh, these numbers stay low. Um, and so not, not any real uh, surprises there. Motor vehicle excise, you know, not a large amount of revenue, but again, it's, it's just useful to see sort of the cyclical nature of how that revenue source, like many of our re revenue sources, can sort of depend on you know, years that people are buying new cars or, or, uh, or people are holding on to their cars longer. Uh, go to the next slide. This is a, 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 a newer, newer revenue for us. Um, you've got the hotel, motel, and meals taxes. Um, the, uh, the hotel motel tax existed um, back to 2003. When we got to 2010, the state passed uh, a local option that we could add additional, uh, we could add to the, both the hotel motel as well as add a meals tax um, on top of our sales tax, which we availed ourselves of. And you can see that those have helped us increase revenue um, and have remained fairly steady. Uh, the 2013 number, there's an asterisk because we still, that's. That's a projection, and it's uh, that we, we suspect it's going to finish at, at or slightly above where we were in 2012. So that's been a fairly uh, strong source of revenue, uh, which I think is important because it also speaks to the fact that the uh, that our downtown has remained fairly healthy, our restaurant and our hotel industry. And I also note that we have one hotel that's uh, going to be going into construction, a new hotel going into construction next year, which will both add to the tax base as well as increase these hotel motel taxes. So the next slide uh, is probably one of the most important uh, slides that we'll talk about tonight. This is our net state aid, uh, and again, taking a look from 2002 to 2013. Uh, and you can sort of see the, the kind of the roller coaster ride that we've been on. 
Um, again, climb, you know, at a, at, a, at a high of about 13.5 million back in 2002, and then the sharp decline, and then we made it back up to about 12.1 uh, million uh, in FY 2008, and then you can see sort of the steady decline uh, ever since uh, in, in terms of state aid. Again, that's education, that's also just general aid on the city side. So taking that 2008 number, which is when we started the latest slide, uh, this shows you kind of the decline since 2008. If, if the state had just level funded us at the 2008 level over these last five years, that would have been $10.3 million in additional revenue that the city would have realized if they had just level funded us uh, during those years. So I just want to keep, I know I'm sort of becoming a broken record, but I just want to emphasize how important these revenue sources and the loss of revenue sources have, have been in terms of affecting our ability to, to, to build a, a, a balanced budget and maintain services. This is state aid. Uh, this is chapter 70 education aid. Uh, these, uh, the blue is, this, is the chapter 70 that comes to us for the Northampton Public Schools. The green is for Smith Vocational. Again, very static. Uh, hasn't been a lot of uh, increases. Um, you know, this has been one of the, uh, like, like local aid, uh, where, um, you know, you could see a slight decline in 2008, but then it's been fairly flat over those times, while at the same time the costs of providing <coughs> that education has, has continued to increase upward. This is the unrestricted general government aid. Uh, this is, again, this is the local aid that comes to the, to the city side of the budget. Um, it used to be broken out into lottery and additional assistance, the blue and red. Uh, then it all got folded into one category, which was called unrestricted general government aid. And interestingly, they folded it all together, and, and it's actually less. Uh, it turned out to be less uh, in FY 2010. Uh, so again, you can see how that's been fairly level, flat, going down um, over, over the last several years. This is uh, charges for services. Uh, this is actually two of our, of our cost centers, our parking uh, fund, and as well as the ambulance service. And this, uh, this is illustrated to show you how we've, over time, been shifting more and more of those parking revenues and those ambulance revenues over to the general uh, budget to help us balance the budget. So in the case of the parking meter receipts, we've been more and more using that to supplement police officers hiring police officers who patrol downtown, paying for police vehicles, uh, paying for all of, the, uh, all of the maintenance and staff in the, in the parking uh, maintenance division, the PEOs, all of that. On the ambulance side, we've used that ambulance revenue to pay for buying new ambulances, for paying uh, for EMT uh, salaries and stipends, um, and again, capital expenditures on the ambulance side. So it's been a revenue source, but increasingly, uh, we've had to uh, uh, use more and more of it to, to, to be able to, uh, to pay for general services. These are the inner fund operating transfers, or the indirect charges. Uh, these are from our three, sol our three enterprise funds. Uh, sewer is red, water is blue, solid waste is yellow. So the enterprise, are, the enterprise funds are separate standalone budgets that perform those tasks, but they do pay back to the general fund a certain amount of money each year to cover the expenses that we provide, the services that we provide to those funds. So for example, the collector's office sends out all the bills, does all the billing, does all of the collections for the water and sewer. So there's a charge back to that. Our, our finance department, our auditing department, legal, all of those uh, things uh, incur, incur charges back. Um, so you can sort of see how that has uh, changed and evolved over time. Obviously the biggest change is that yellow one, which is the solid waste, and you can see as we've now made the decision to close the landfill, those, uh, those indirect charges back to the city have now gone down, gone down, gone down, and in, and in FY 2014 they'll be gone. Uh, and uh, again, you can see sort of the shift between water and sewer. But these are important, uh, has been an important revenue source for us on the general side, as well as obviously paying for providing those important infrastructure for the city. These are just uh, parking tickets and RMV fines. Again, uh, another revenue source. The parking tickets obviously are self-explanatory. The RMV fines are any other tickets that get issued in Northampton. 
Uh, you know, not, not, uh, not any discernible trends here. There was a, a slight downturn, uh, sort of following the same downturn in other revenues. Uh, it has gone up a little bit. Um, but again, this is one of the other revenue sources that we rely on to be able to provide uh, the services in the general fund. These are licenses and permits. Again, another one of those revenues, not a very big revenue source, but definitely very cyclical um, and, and tied to the economy. So this is everything from the permits that the building inspector issues, plumbing inspector, wire inspector, weights and measures. And you can kind of see how those have been uh, fairly you know, up and down, up and down uh, over time. Uh, and again, uh, tied to the economy and, and particularly to the housing cycle. It's investment in income. Again, th this is the this uh, you know our, our uh, the funds that we have in bank accounts uh, to to run the city. This is the investment income that we earn on that. I'm sure this doesn't look much different than your uh, savings or CD statements that you have at home. You can see in 2006, 2007, uh, you know the the numbers that we were earning in those years. Uh, you know, upwards of six hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, now in 2013, about 123,000. So that's a drop again of, of, of revenue, just an in investment income uh, in the bank. These are some federal revenues. We don't get a lot of federal aid, uh, fairly, but this is Medicaid, Medicare, and CDBG indirects. Again, not a lot that we get from the federal government anymore, but you can again see the same kind of downward trend um, over the last several years. So now we'll just move over to the expense side of the budget. These are the uh, expense trends, and we'll go ahead and start with that same pie chart that I showed you before. Um, this is basically how we spend our money, and it's broken down into the various uh, categories. We show here education as the largest at 38%. Um, employee benefits, that's health care, insurance, retirement, um, at 20%. And then we move over into public safety, debt service, general government. Um, one of the things about this chart, uh, obviously education is, is the largest <coughs> expenditure, but then you also have to factor in that a, a portion of other parts of the budget also go toward education. So employee benefits, um, the debt service, uh, as well as those charges, state assessment charges that we'll talk about, which are for charter school and for school choice. And this is actually a chart that, that kind of depicts that. Um, so if you factor in the debt service on school projects, if you factor in the employee benefits that the city pays on school, um, on school employees like health care, um, if you factor in the state assessments for charter and for school choice, um, uh, then it actually brings that number up to 58% of the budget is devoted to education um, in the city. And then you can sort of see how the others, uh, how the others play out when we, when we shift it that way. This is again that same uh, that same overview of the of the various parts of the budget. You know, obviously public works is our DPW. Um, you know, culture and recreation, which is two percent, includes the libraries. It includes the rec department. It includes first night and the arts council. Human services is the board of health, the vets, and the council on aging. And you can kind of see the various uh, different uh, services that we provide under each one of those budget categories. This is an interesting uh, chart. We looked at the 10-year average percentage increases over that 10-year span, uh, 2004 uh, to 2013. And these were kind of the, the top three um, areas that went up the most over that 10-year period. Now, I know the human services one is, sort of stands out, that 12.81%, but that's largely the veterans benefits. We've seen that spike in veterans benefits over the last 10 years. The city, um, uh, provides veterans benefits to, to any eligible veterans in the city, the state reimburses us at 75%, but we don't get it to the next fiscal year. So we have to budget for, that, uh, for, those, um, for, for those benefits every year. So that's been a major area. State assessments, which we'll look at a chart for later, I think the, the big, the big uh, rise there has been charter school uh, tuition and the, and the school choice uh, uh, sending tuitions. And then employee benefits, uh, which again is health care, retirement, et cetera. So those have been sort of the three largest increases in spending um, that have happened over those, uh, over those several years. And I would say, just to point out, that you know, the top, the, at least the, t well, two of them, and you could make an argument one way or the other for the three, are largely beyond our control. 
Um, they're not things that we have an ability to control. Obviously, we want to provide as much veterans benefits as we can for the veterans in our city. Uh, the other one, the, the charter and school choice, obviously, you know, uh, that's, that's a number we look at and we obviously try to work on uh, school choice and trying to attract and keep kids in our district and obviously the healthcare one. Uh, larger forces at work in the healthcare economy, but we've also tried to take steps to minimize that as well. So this is the education appropriation. So this is just stripping away all the, you know, the, the choice, the charter, the debt, all of the other parts that go into education funding and just purely looking at the education appropriation from the general fund, blue for school department, green uh, for Smith Folk. Again, level, fairly level, not very you know, major increases over time, which again reflects the general overall stress in the city budget um, that you see across all departments. This is employee benefits. This is our retirement assessment. The city each year uh, receives an assessment for what it needs to pay into the retirement system to keep that system solvent for our, our, for our retired employees. And each year that's been, uh, that's been growing. Uh, so, uh, so that's another one of those uh, ones that we'll look at and there'll be an increase this year as well. This is health insurance expenditures for the city. Uh, this is again taking that 10 year view at, at what we're paying uh, to provide health insurance for our employees. You can see uh, back in FY 2003, we were down just under $6 million. And then you can sort of follow the, the, the rise over to FY 2013, uh, where we are now paying $10,400,000 uh, for those benefits. Again, that's a major a major change and it's, uh, and it's one of the big cost drivers in our budget. It's also one of the reasons why I asked the city council uh, last November to uh, give me and the city the authority under the new health insurance reform law to be able to make uh, plan design changes outside of collective bargaining through a new process that the state has developed. And the city council did vote to give me that authority and that's going to be one of the things we're going to be looking at to try to see if there are ways that we can find savings in health insurance because again, it's one of our biggest uh, budget drivers. This is uh, showing police and fire, our public safety expenditures. You can kind of see how uh, blue is the police, red is fire. Uh, that's fairly intuitive, I hope. And, um, and uh, you can sort of see how those have changed over time. Uh, you can see how fire has kind of uh, sort of caught up with uh, police largely uh, because of the ambulance and moving to a full-time EMS service. Um, so you can see how public safety, although in the last three years, obviously that's been flat. We've, we've uh, had to level fund essentially those, uh, those three budget areas, or those three budget years. This is debt. So this is, uh, this is basically our debt service, what we're paying to service the debt that we've borrowed to pay for all the various projects uh, that we have. The little teeny tiny ones, capital leases, that's for you know, small things where we may you know, buy, uh, buy equipment on a five-year lease. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, long-term, uh, let's see, the, the temporary bonds, uh, principal and pay down, those we do short-term uh, borrowings from time to time until we build up enough uh, that we want to do a, a full long-term borrowing. So that reflects that in the green. Uh, the red is the interest on our long-term bonds, and then the, uh, the dark is the long-term bond principal. Again, you can sort of see um, how that um, has, has uh, changed over time. We've, had to, we've actually made more investments in recent years in our capital infrastructure, trying to, trying to renew our fleet of, of trucks and vehicles, and uh, as well as working on major capital projects like the senior center, the police station, uh, our school building uh, projects, et cetera. <coughs> so this is a look at future projected debt. So that's starting at 2013 and we and looking at projections for how that debt's going to play out over the next 10 years with the projects that are in the pipeline as well as ones that we've put that, that have been put in the pipeline uh, in the past. For example, the DPW uh, facility, uh, which was put in uh, the pipeline by the previous administration, there's an $8.5 million 
uh, projection there that was put in the budget uh, that would be that would was projected to be bonded in 2016 that's in there so you the most important numbers to look at on this chart I mean the the top three the yellow the red and the green are really sort of outside sources that pay for the debt they it's either um, an outside source or it's the CPA or the CDPG funds the debt or MSBA reimbursements which are really just the states paying back for a, poor, a share of the borrowing the one that are important to the general fund budget, well, the blue is the debt excluded debt. So those are the ones where we've done debt exclusion overrides. But the, the most, so probably the most important one, <coughs> that's what we have to come up with from the general fund budget to pay for the debt service on that particular year. So again, you can see how that's a number that as we try to make investments in our infrastructure, in our buildings, uh, we have to borrow and we have to be able to service that debt. So you know, every time that we incur another 100,000 or 200,000 in debt service, that's less that we have available in the general budget to put towards other services. Um, but again, it's uh, it's 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 sort of a pay now or pay later. We can we can only defer maintenance on buildings. We can only defer buying vehicles for so long, uh, and and then it becomes more costly if we don't make those investments. So this is, again, the state assessments that I talked about. This is school choice and charter school. It's important to note that the, these, the way these function, uh, they're not part of the school budget. They actually come out of the general fund budget. So the state takes them out of the general fund budget. Um, they're not deducted from, from school aid or from the school budget. So you can see, again, the climb. Blue is charter school sending tuition, the money that we send out. Uh, to other schools when a, when a Northampton student goes to a charter school and then the red is school choice when someone choices in to another uh, district from Northampton. Again, you can see uh, the rise in that over time um, and it's again, I start from where we were in FY 2003 where it was about you know, 800,000 a year, it's now climbed to over two and a half million a year that we're sending um, out, of, out of our city uh, to pay for those tuitions. FY 2014, that's a uh, revenue pro uh, a projection that's off the, the cherry sheet that the governor issued with his budget. You can see the trend continues. So what does all this mean for um, FY 2014? And my office was cute and found this little crystal ball. <laughs> it's not me in the suit, but uh, I thought that was fun. So, so what does all this mean when we take a look at where, where we've come in the FY 2013 budget, what our revenues are looking like, uh, what, our, what our expenditures are looking like? So we'll take a, a quick look through that. So this is the, um, these are the estimated revenue changes that we're fairly confident we know we have to deal with in FY 2014 in 14. These are revenues that we think we'll be able to uh, to get in, in the upcoming uh, fiscal year. Obviously the Prop 2.5 increase uh, is is fairly <coughs> set. That's that's the 1.94 uh, 1.094 million. New growth that I mentioned before, 600,000. And then you kind of go down through the other various revenue sources that we're fairly certain we can count on. The one that I have to put a big asterisk on is under state aid. And that's, uh, you see I've noted that that's based on the governor's budget proposal. So last week the governor uh, on, the, on the 23rd uh, released House 1, which was his budget uh, that he presents to the legislature. Um, obviously it's a very ambitious budget. He's really called for some very bold uh, revenue measures. He's calling for very bold investments in transportation uh, as well as in um, education, particularly in the early childhood. Uh, and secondary education, and, and really trying to, to, to start a conversation about revenue that our legislature has frankly been trying to dodge for the last several years. And I think he's really now tried to put <coughs> this out there. And so far, the reception has been, has been good. There hasn't, uh, it hasn't been dead on arrival. I think that my sense from the House and the Senate in talking to folks there, that they, they do recognize the need to look at new revenues, but whether what his budget will look like by the time the House issues their budget, we're not sure. But we've plugged <coughs> in for now uh, the, the, the new aid that we forecast as part of the governor's uh, budget, which again, in Chapter 70, in the governor's budget, we would see a $71,000 increase in Chapter 70. 
So not a major increase in funds. On the general government side, we'd see about 134,000 uh, in, in, uh, in new aid. Again, not even, one, not even really a 1% increase from last year. So, so we've tried to build all that in. And so our estimated new revenue is 1.395. 912 or 1.4 million. So that's what we expect. Uh, we will be able to, to grow a new revenue above what we had in FY13. Uh, so that's the revenue side. We'll go to the uh, to the expense side. And again, these are known expense changes uh, that we know. In most cases, we we know we have to uh, incorporate into the budget. So that retirement assessment that I talked about, where we have to make a contribution to the retirement fund, that's going up 240,000, so we know we have to increase that. There's several things, the overlay exemptions and overlay deficits, those are required. Uh, the assessors have to build those into uh, their offices uh, when, when they're doing the tax uh, program because they have to be, have them available by law to be able to cover exemptions that people may file for in a given fiscal year. Again, you see that charter school sending tuition number, that's going up 295,435, again, on the general uh, side. Um, you can go down the line and see where we've tried to build in uh, increases for workers' comp. Uh, uh, we've tried to build in modest investments in those reserve funds I talked about, our debt service. Um, which actually is going down slightly. Uh, our our, um, our uh, debt excluded debt actually goes down each year. Um, so we're actually seeing a little bit of uh, a decrease in that category. Uh, we've got a legal settlement with the firefighters. That's a, a $45,000 charge that, that is pending at this point. And then we've got all the collective uh, bargaining agreements that we reached in FY13 on the city side that we used tailings from the FY12 budget to pay for, we know we have to incorporate those into next year's budget. And then on the health insurance side, I'm putting in a projection here of 10% of on the increase. Um, and, and that's sort of a marker at this point. I, I, frankly, I'm concerned that it could be higher than that, and we can talk about that in the next slide. Last year, we started with about a 12 or 12.8% 12 quote on our insurance. Uh, that did come down to about 8% by the end of it. But when we met with our insurance, we have a consultant that we use that, that helps us in this health insurance uh, market. They look at our utilization rates. They look at how much insurance our employees utilize. Um, and we're, so the, the benchmark usually in the insurance industry is about 80 to 85%, uh, 85 to 90%. And in fact, you may know the new state law says that if your insurance company um, doesn't spend or spends less than the 85%, you get a rebate check. Uh, and, so, or, and so some people have been getting checks, uh, rebate checks. Uh, but, but really, where we are in terms of our utilization is in the 97 to 98% in terms of employee utilization. So we know that the, the insurance company, by keeping our rates down, have been sort of taking a loss in their, in their administrative overhead and, and other uh, profit centers in order to allow us to stay where we are. So we know that that's going to come up again. We're still waiting. They, they, um, the rate quotes have not yet come in from the, various, uh, from the various providers. And the other factor that we're waiting for is the GIC. The GIC rates have not yet been set. And again, that's something under this new health care reform that we that we've now have the authority to work under, the GIC becomes a benchmark for the conversations that you have about health insurance. Uh, so we really need that number as well. So that's going to be the one that we're going to be working on in the next several weeks uh, with our consultant and, and ultimately meeting with our employees about to see if we can either keep that, arrive at a lower number than that 10% increase. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, keep those costs under control. But for now, we're using that 10%. So 1.95 million, again, are the known expense changes. So again, turn, turn to the next slide, and you can see the, the, what we're estimating for revenue, what we, what we know are some of our expenses at this point. Currently, that shows a gap um, of $560,000. Again, this is very preliminary because we still have a lot of unknowns. There's that health insurance number that could exceed 
Um, the other thing that we have to factor in is that all of our uh, bargaining units, both on the school side and the city side, uh, will have open contracts in, in, the, in FY14. So uh, there, though there are increases there that have to be factored in, steps and COLA increases and any other, um, any other uh, expenditures that may be um, warranted because of a collective bargaining agreement. We also have some grants that are expiring, which we're still waiting to find out about in terms of what those may have impact on. We're also in the Joint Labor Management uh, Committee, the JLMC, with the Firefighters Union. The firefighters have not had a contract for three years, so we're now in a formal state process. So we, we and that process is going on, and we're not sure what the decision will be, but we have to be able to fund that decision. Uh, uh, and then the final one is departmental budget needs. We're going to be obviously meeting with all of our departments, obviously the school department and all of our city departments to look at what their individual budget needs are and there may be unique needs in each department that may also warrant additional, uh, additional expenditures. But for now, that's sort of the working uh, gap that we have. So what are the next steps? So again, in, in February, I'm going to begin meeting with all of uh, the departments. Uh, we'll be uh, sending out budget worksheets to them, and we'll be sitting down with them to really go through their, obviously, their 13 budgets with an eye towards building their budgets uh, for 14. Um, in March, I'm going to be, again, doing a series of the town hall budget meetings around the city. I've, I've already uh, uh, plugged in, uh, I think, five of them here, one, two, three, four, five of them, and we'll be putting out that schedule again to get out into the community to talk about some of these issues and try to get feedback from the community as I try to put together uh, my budget. Under the new charter, uh, there's sort of a different chronology now, so April 17th, uh, 2013. Uh, we're hoping that the two school budgets, the Northampton Public Schools and, and the Smith School, will have adopted their budgets so that they can be submitted to the mayor. Um, and then I am required by charter to submit, uh, to submit my budget to the city council, and the date that we've identified for that is May 16th, uh, 2013. So there's a lot of time that's going to pass here, and there's a lot of these numbers uh, that are really preliminary at this point. Uh, that will start to shape up and and as we go through these conversations with departments as i go out into the public and talk with them um, we'll be trying to share that information as we know it obviously the health care one is going to be a big uh, number and then the other big number we'll be looking at very carefully is that toward the end of march the house will be finally releasing its budget probably about the first week in april the house of representatives will release its budget and i think that's really we typically uh, the House budget has typically been the sort of the benchmark for what ultimately happens. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the House does with the with the governor's uh, you know very bold proposals uh, for revenue, um, and, and really looking at what they're doing. Particularly, we'll be watching obviously in Chapter 78 and in local aid um, what those what those numbers work out to be. Next slide. Actually, I think that's the last slide. So. Do you want to <coughs> shut that down? So that concludes my sort of overall presentation. Again, I, what I've tried to do is go through you know, what we've done in FY 2013, tried to talk about that, that, that issue um, of our reserve position and why it's so important. And again, the, the, the difficulty of the reserve position is you know, you've got the general budget here, and you're trying to make decisions about what you want to fund in the here and now. But you have to also have discipline to try to make sure you're you're keeping some amount of savings in your in your savings account, um, and and again it has in, it has greater impacts than just on your local budget because then when you go out to borrow, your bond rating can be affected by that. And again, I hearken back to that uh, to the bond report. We will be issuing the, a copy of that uh, latest bond rating. And again, the concern is uh, they were I think. Likely, we might have been downgraded this time, but I think they were impressed with the work that we had done very aggressively in the FY 2013 budget to really build up our reserves, as well as I think they were very impressed with our strong values in Northampton, the valuations of our property, and all the economic development that's going on, uh, particularly in the King Street and Village Hill area. Um, so those are some of the major issues. Um, and then I guess I would open up the floor for any questions or discussion. Um, this meeting is sort of intended to kind of launch the formal budget process 
uh, and sort of set the stage for that. So any comments or questions that people have? Mr. Bourne. Um, do you have any idea why our uh, health insurance uh, utilization rates are so high? And is that anything we can? I think it's a combination of, uh, I think the, I, frankly, I think we've, well, we've been very creative and worked very hard and worked with our employees to try to keep, uh, to, to try to tinker with things like co-pays and tinker with trying to make sure people utilize generics. And, and frankly, also our, our provider has really wanted to keep us as a client, uh, Health New England. And I appreciate that. And so they've, in some cases, I think, given us rates that probably are discounted. Um, and, then I, and, and so I think the result is you see that we're, we're, you know, we're utilizing a lot more because probably we should be paying a lot more uh, based on the size of our city. We, we do dig down and drill down into the numbers. And they take a look. They, we walk through with our consultant. They look at claims. They look at drug utilization. They look at some of our you know, folks who have really uh, serious illnesses. Um, there's not really any one factor. Uh, again, I just think that it's, it's, a, it's a fact of, you know, the fact that we've, we've kept those rates suppressed in some sense. Um, and now I think we're kind of butting up against that in the last couple of years. I see. Okay. So. Councilor. Yes, uh, Mayor, how many other cities are right now connected with GIC? Do you know? Um, hmm, I wish I had that chart with me. Uh, there are several cities, uh, several cities around, well, for example, in our local area, uh, Pittsfield, Springfield um, are in the GIC. Obviously, UMass is in the GIC because they're in the yeah. state. A lot of eastern <coughs> Massachusetts communities um, are in the GIC. Uh, and so it is something that we'll look at. Uh, but more importantly, the this is the Group Insurance Commission. This is the state's health care plan. They go out every year and purchase health care for their employees. And they it's basically a, a cafeteria plan. You get to choose from several different. And in fact, Health New England uh, is one of them, same provider that we use. Um, and you get and they negotiate the rates with all these insurance providers. Um, and so uh, they kind of use the economy of scale of all their employees in the state to be able to negotiate better rates. Um, so that is something that we'll look at. But more importantly, we'll be looking at what the GIC rates are, because th those now become the benchmark that we can use in this new process. If we can show that we can offer a plan uh, that is comparable or better to the GIC and can generate savings, we're allowed greater latitude in terms of moving into that plan. Um, that's kind of how the new health reform law works. There's a process that we go through. There's an employee committee. Um, that we meet with to talk about those changes. But if we can meet certain benchmarks and we can show certain savings and share some of the savings with employees in the first year, then we're allowed to move into it. So that's something we're going to be taking a really close look at. It, it was, a, it was a, a, an interesting year because this was the year that the GIC went out to bid on all of its plans. It doesn't do that every year. It does it like every three years. Um, and then they have a meeting coming up at the end of February. Uh, well, in, in February, we hope to actually set the rates for the year. So that's when you'll see uh, what the rates will be. We've actually missed the deadline to go into it. Um, uh, that's the other oddity about the GIC is that you have to notify them uh, by December 1st to move into it. This year, we would have been flying triple blind because A, we don't know what the rates are. B, we don't even know who the providers are. Um, and, and we don't even know what our, what our plan is going to come in at. So, it uh, wasn't really prudent to, to look at it or think about even moving into it, um, but we are going to take a look at those numbers very carefully uh, over the next couple of months and see if we can come up with some savings. Thank you. Yep. In uh, 10 Thanks, cities, sir. 26 towns, 8 school districts, and 4 charters. Yeah, a number of my colleagues in the eastern part of the state, Salem, uh, uh, is one that I know um, moved into it recently. Um, and uh, so it's, it's been more of an Eastern Mass. I mean, I think we've done a really good job of containing costs. Um, and uh, so and Eastern plans and Eastern hospitals have tended to be way more expensive. Um, but again, as, as we start to feel the pressure, it's something we have to take a look at. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Counselor? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the, the presentation. And it, um, it's like almost like a broken record. It seems to be year after year after year. Any uh, increase in the levy that we have or uh, new growth 
is always consumed by health insurance and retirement. It's almost to the penny. So when anything else that comes in above is, is a bigger debt, it's, it's a bigger hole. So I think that's, I think that's important because I, I know that, and again, I, I've worked very hard um, and I know the superintendent has on the school side, really looking at spending, trying to look at um, how we can build in efficiencies, how we can try to, in some cases, merge departments. Um, but at the end of the day, the, one of the biggest problems we have is not the spending, it's the revenue. It's the, and you can see that graphic we showed where over the last five years, we've lost $10 million. You know, if we had just been level funded, that's revenue that we could have had to pay for those health insurance increases, to pay for those charter school assessments, uh, to pay for you know, adding services that we needed to add. So um, I keep stressing it's a, it's a revenue, it, it really is a revenue issue. Um, and I you know, obviously look to Beacon Hill uh, because that's where we've seen uh, a, 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 the largest drop off in terms of our budget. Uh, we're at 20% of our budget now, it used to be 30% of our budget not too long ago. So that's, uh, that's an important, we're limited what we can do at the local level. We've, impl you know, we obviously, uh, you know, taxed to the full two and a half percent levy. We've done an override. Uh, we've adopted the full meals tax. We've adopted the full hotel motel tax. We've adopted the CPA to try to help. And you know, I think Northampton has really um, availed itself of everything we can do at the local level. Um, and now I think we're, we're seeing, uh, we're, we need to be hopeful that the leadership in Boston will take steps to try to increase revenue uh, for the state, but also for cities and towns. Uh, uh, the superintendent and then Mr. Moore. Uh, first, I want to say thank you uh, for this presentation tonight. And I want to compliment both you and Susan Wright for putting together this presentation. Uh, it's my second time through it. And I have to say, just one of the finest presentations of uh, any place that I've worked. Uh, detailed, comprehensive, and yet you explain it in a way that's very easy to understand and to follow how we get to where we get to. So thank you very much for the time that you both have put into this. Okay. As we're sitting here taking notes and uh, getting to work tomorrow morning on building our school budget, uh, you know, last year we were level funded and you were able to give us a, a 200,000 more to build our school budget. But as I'm looking at this this year, and I know you'll give us more specific direction soon, uh, to me it doesn't look like it's even a, a chance of level funded for the school department for next year. And uh, yeah, I mean, just want to hear your were, thoughts on that. Susan and I were actually, and again, I do want to thank Susan, and I want to thank Lynn Simmons in my office, and and everyone on, on my staff who's helped work to. It was, it's been a scramble even up to the last hour or so to finalize this presentation. Um, and we have been talking about that. I think, um, uh, you know, I, I think you're right. I think level funding is, uh, you know, maybe optimistic at this point. Um, but I do think that we're going to try to be very aggressive in terms of trying to find those savings in health care. I also think, you know, I think we're going to have to um, you know, on the on the city side and the school committee on the on the school side, in collective bargaining, I think we really have to try to tell this story to our employees. Um, and I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to meet with employees. I'm you know willing to talk with school employees about it and really try to tell the story that we're facing right now, um, in terms of those negotiations, because those are still the, those are some of the biggest unknowns in terms of what will impact that gap. Um, so that so yes, I think that's an accurate appraisal. Um, I think we're, I think we probably will start though with building a level funded budget to see what that looks like, and then we may have to then build in contingencies, you know, maybe on a larger basis for things like the the um, collective bargaining agreements uh, that we can try to uh, cover as we go forward. We'll see. That's, but I think you're, I think you're right. We haven't released the budget sheets yet. We'll be doing that next week. We're going to be talking about it some more. Um, but I think that that's, you know, again, I think we're looking at, once again, trying to provide the same level of services without the uh, commensurate increase in in funding to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Moore, um, is the is the city free cash amount? Does that include any? Um, reserves in the school's budget? Uh, no. Uh, no, that's, we don't, that doesn't get calculated towards that. So, so like the, to it, like the um, choice, uh, what's the fund called? 
circuit breaker. Circuit breaker and school. We have in reserves. Yeah. No, we're not counting those reserves. And I'm also, it's also important to note that we're not also we're not focusing on the um, reserves that the water enterprise fund or the sewer enterprise fund or because we can't access those. Those. That's are, what I was wondering. It was, yeah. If, if it would be helpful if we could put them in, if those numbers could be in there. Yeah. Um, well, the problem is that you know. It, it, it may not be helpful because if I put the water enterprise reserve fund in there, we can't use the water. By law, we can't touch the water reserve enterprise fund for anything but the water system. So, um, but but certainly reserves on the school side, right, um, which I'm not sure where those stand at this point. But it just seems like it would be a way to make the number bigger without having more money. Uh, well, unfortunately, what no. we what we end up doing is we give all of our financials to them. They go through it. They they're the ones who set the the benchmark. Well, I mean, it's a city reserve because I mean, we're one of the yeah. departments of the city, and that in other words, the other departments don't. In other words, their free cash, DPW's free cash, isn't DPW's free cash. It's the city's free You're cash. Correct. Yeah. And so and and so that's what I'm saying about the school's free cash, which is that we're not getting credit for it in terms of our bond rating. Yeah, but even we, though it seems to me to be analogous to. Yeah. I think it's probably. I think they. I think it's looked at, but I, again, it's not something that. That's the school departments and the school committees. It doesn't the city council can't appropriate the, those funds? And maybe Susan can add to that. School choice is restricted, mm -hmm. so it can't be considered free cash. Schools don't. You don't have any free cash. You have reserves. You have school choice. You have circuit breaker. Wherever those, you know, whatever balances those have. But circuit breaker is restricted to special ed costs, and school choice is only can 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 only be spent by appropriation of the school committee. So that's why those can't get figured in. Free cash actually has to be what the city has that's basically not spoken for in some other way. So it's very analogous to the enterprise funds. Yes. Mr. Meyer, and then just since we mentioned the water system, I'm just wondering about um, the m tens of millions of dollars that may be needed to upgrade storm sewers mm -hmm. and outfalls under new yep. EPA regulations, as well as the article today about 14.7 million for the dam system. Yes, and I'm wondering. <laughs> Let's keep coming. Yes, <laughs> even though, and even though those are outside yep. the city's bonding, um, but they still put pressure on residents of the city. Those are still amounts that are paid by taxpayers. And so if, if taxpayers are paying money there, then they have less resources available for debt exclusion overrides for new facilities like the DPW that we desperately need for any upgrades to schools. And so I'm wondering, is there the bigger, bigger picture in that we not only have this pressure that we need revenue from the city, but we also have infrastructure that's aging. And I think there's no doubt about it. And I know, uh, you know, the council's putting together a task force to look at the stormwater uh, management issue, which is again the the um, the stormwater management, the the, de the levees, the dams, uh, and again trying to figure out. There's a we've got a very scary two volume report. Uh, Camp Dresser McGee, which shows you know, two hundred million dollars of projects over the next twenty years that we need to accomplish. Some of it because it's required by regulations. Others because we just have an aging system, right. and especially with the storm events we've been having, we've seen that system seriously taxed. So uh, that's they're going to be having a conversation on that committee, uh, looking at um, how you pay for those things over time, and you know, like we have. Uh, inter we have you know user fees for water we have user fees for sewer for solid waste one of the things they'll be looking at which the consultant recommended and which other communities have adopted is a user fee for stormwater mm -hmm. again to create a funding stream to be able to pay for those infrastructure needs but your point is well taken again it's still you can call it something else you can call it a fee uh, uh, and, uh, but it's still going to add to the burden on residents in terms of what they have to pay. Um, so the point's well taken. And we and again, we have to look at that in, in, in a fuller context when we talk about uh, overrides and things like that. Uh, people this year, you know, $14.26, you know, 25 cents of that is toward the police station, um, which again, much needed facility. Uh, the community was very supportive of it, um, but it does sort of show uh, the, the, the stresses that are being put on taxpayers and ratepayers. Um, though I will point out, you know, again, looking at the slide in terms of where we fall in terms of our tax burden, we are, I think we do have a relatively low tax rate 
right. relative to other communities. So, you know, I'm, we often look at our neighbors across the river and marvel at how are they able to do the things they're able to do and, right. and then, you know, look at their tax rate. Uh, they've done three overrides uh, in, the, in the last several years. So that, that, that explains it in, in many ways. Councilor Tate. And to uh, Mr. Uh, Moore's point, we also have overlay surplus or overlay accounts too that don't show up in free cash and different reserves that um, we can uh, tap into. And we still, and to Mr. Meyer's point, we have no idea how to come up with this stormwater money that we're going to need. And that's going to be another huge burden on the taxpayer or ratepayer, however you want to put it, depending on which pocket it comes out of. Um, it's tough. It, uh, when you go to the bargaining table, what do you go there with? You're nothing. I mean, Not there's nothing there. That, <laughs> 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 you're going to buy lotto tickets. Yeah. yeah. Um, other questions, other comments? Again, we'll be kind of now moving into this uh, process. Um, the school committee will have its time frame for the budget. The city council, once I submit my budget under the charter, there's now new rules about having public hearings and 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 uh, and the goal of obviously is to get a balanced budget by uh, by July by June 30th, and we'll do our best to do that again, trying to maintain uh, the quality services that we provide and and trying to continue to provide the best education we can provide. And I'll be working with the school committee, working with the city council to try to achieve that goal. Uh, no, of course, just a couple of comments. Um, one, again, not only was this a very clear presentation, but also the earliest we've ever had it. We've never had this discussion in at the end of January, and we've never sat with our, our city councilors uh, this early. Usually we sit together in, uh, in May, where you make comments on how we've chosen to spend the money that we have. So this is very different. Um, it, it, there isn't much room right now for a discussion between the, the two boards, and I'm wondering um, if, 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 if uh, this is really meant to be just a presentation or if you're also looking for us to have discussion. But I wanted to comment on, on two other things. One, I'm sure I wasn't the only school committee member who was very disappointed after l listening to the, um, the governor speak. I was very uplifted by his focus on um, education in particular. It was very disappointing to hear that the grand total coming to Northampton was $71,000. Uh, when, when, I, when I first heard that number, I thought, oh my goodness, after all of that um, excitement about him, you know, really t talking about education in Massachusetts. Um, it doesn't really get us very far here, um, especially with the with the deficit that we're going into the the budget season with. Um, but the other thing that I want to comment on, um, it, you know, you, you made a comment about how we have to tell the story to all the unions that we're negotiating with, and and um, Councillor Tacey is asking, you know, what do we go to the tables with? This isn't the first time the, the um, members of the unions are hearing this sad story. And I just want to say th this is such a, a, a difficult story to have to keep telling the same people who are working so hard for us. Um, I'm not saying anything that you all don't know, but um, it's, it's one thing to say we need to tell the story and they need to hear this. It's another thing to be on the other side of that, you know, to be at the table and um, and to hear that and, and to continue working and be motivated and to do the good job that they're all doing. Um, so I just, just wanted to comment on that because I, it's, you know, it's just year after year of not being able to provide for them, provide for our students, provide for our district in the way that we would like to. It's, it's one thing for the superintendent to come and tell us, you know, how we can improve our district and to, um, what was the, the, the plan, what was, what did we call it, the plan that you came up with, the ideal? Yeah, educationally, sound educationally sound budget, but we don't have we don't have education we don't have sound monies to to yes. approach that with, and, um, and I'm, I, you it's know, disheartening. I can assure you, my my DPW director could submit a public work sound budget and our yeah. and your fire and your police and fire exactly. I, I don't mean to. I, I get that. I speak from school committee, but I'm, I speak as a member of the of the community for all of our departments exactly. and all the people who are working for us. I don't expect you to have an answer for that. I'm just commenting that it's, you know, we're telling the same sub story year after year, and um, even when the governor comes to us and says you know, we're going to give up, give monies now for education and for infrastructure for transportation, it, when it comes to the individual cities and towns like Northampton, it really doesn't help us as much as it sounded like it might. Well, I just want to say what, just a couple comments about that. So. I, I do agree with you about the employees, and one of the things we tried to do in, in this current year budget, and I, one of the commitments I made 
um, when I got elected was to really, you know, we'd had several years of no increases, of zeros, and we did try to provide, uh, you know, reasonable increases, uh, you know, very, very small, but at least to show that we're trying to, uh, we understand the sacrifices they've made. I know on the school side, the same thing occurred. Um, and so, you know, again, you know, all we can do is sort of show people the picture that we're working with. Um, and, and, you know, we didn't have the slide in this one, but, you know, when you look at, when you look at, you know, breaking down the percentages of where all these dollars goes, I mean, about 80% of it goes to people. It goes to the salaries and the benefits, and they're the largest component of our budget that we spend our money on. And so, naturally, when you're, when you, you know, have pressures, that's who it's going to affect the most. Um, and I, you know, we, we have, uh, outside agencies that are constantly trying to lure away good people with higher pay, neighboring states. I was just looking at a newscast in some police department in New Braintree that was offering huge bonuses, trying to attract people. Um, it's a very competitive environment. Um, I happen to think that Northampton is a great city to work for. We have a great school system to work in, but your point is well taken. On the Chapter 70 thing, we're still trying to unpack the formula a little bit, but there, there they're trying to do some additional things in addition to just giving normal Chapter 70. There were some issues, sort of equity issues in funding that they were trying to address as well in the budget. So they, they actually put more money into Chapter 70, but it's going to communities that need to really catch up in terms of, uh, in terms of where they are um, in what they're spending. Um, and it, you know, there's some interesting stuff I'll share with the school committee about that. Um, some some slideshows that kind of depict how those uh, formula budgets have played out and in fact in some cases they're raising the amount that school districts are now required uh, to spend on education without giving them commensurate amount of aid um, we were at, at, chat, at the Mass Municipal Association weekend uh, meeting this weekend uh, with a bunch of selectmen and, and everyone was kind of dissecting the budget and I think the town of Weymouth uh, the way the governor's budget played out against just the governor's preliminary budget, they were going to have to come up with like an additional two million dollars in school spending to meet their minimum requirement, and they were getting about two hundred thousand in new Chapter 78. Um, so you know, a lot of it comes back to those formulas, but those formulas go back to 1993 and the the ruling that you know Massachusetts needed to provide you know a, a level playing field in terms of education funding. So we're still bound by those formulas that were set back in 1993, which don't always provide a, a modern snapshot of, of, of what it costs to provide an education. So that's a whole separate lobbying piece that we always talk about, um, but it's very difficult to change those formulas because anytime you change it, it may help one town, but it's going to affect another town. So the council president. Another way of looking at this, and maybe this more optimistic, <coughs> putting a better spin on it, but the the governor's allocation to us is a reflection of how well we're doing, which is, you know, you're rewarded by behaving well. That we're not, and the, the, the communities that are failing are the ones that are obviously in greater need, would be one way of looking at it. Um, it's clearly not a meritocracy. We're not, we're not granted based on our abilities, but the fact is that Northampton's diminishing returns from the state are a reflection of the fact that Northampton is actually a successful community in, in a successful school system in a, six, in a, in a well managed city in the, in the eyes of apparently any number of agencies that look at it. So that's the rosy way of looking at it. Of course, it, it manifests as less and less money, which is the harder thing. But clearly, I think what it reflects is that we are dealing with the hard challenges as they're presented as a, a rational functioning community. And the communities that aren't able to function and deal with these things rationally are the ones that need the, the greater amount of help, is, I would assume, the governor's perspective. So we're doing a very good job. And we have been challenged like this, as, as Councilor Tacey said, this is a broken record. The point, in fact, is we've been challenged like this for decades. And as such, and I think we've met that challenge every time to our credit, very well, uh, with a great deal of, and that doesn't come without an associated amount of pain. But the fact is, is that we we are 
fortunate in that and that's I realize now that I, even saying it seems very strange when I'm expressing it in the context of this conversation but I, I, I think that if there's any consolation to be derived from this is the fact that we are a well-managed well-functioning well-behaved city hmm. and, and we're doing a good job or questions from the school committee or city council? Councilor Murphy. I'm just going to move to adjourn. Okay. <laughs> so uh, there's been a motion to adjourn. I'll second that. It's been seconded by uh, Councilor Moore. Any other discussion about the I guess it's a non-debatable motion. <laughs> All right. In favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? So this uh, joint meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.